Thank you so much, John. Thanks, for, Meredith, for sharing the slides. Um, I am Sarah Hart, and I am really happy to be joining everybody today um, to, for this really important topic, like John was saying. And, and you know, there are a few things that I wanted to highlight before we even get started. And obviously, you see the agenda on your screen now. But a few, a few things to say that um, this is really, like John said, the, the, the tip of the iceberg. You know, we, we wanted to make sure we start this conversation, but I really want you all to know that this is not the beginning, middle, and end of a conversation. This is the beginning. So we actually, when Adriana and I were putting these slides together, we were like, you know, there's so much to talk about. There's, there's so much to cover. Um, there, it's impossible to go over all of these things in depth today. So this is an introduction, but really it's a homework assignment. Uh, I feel like I'm gonna put my teacher hat on and, and ask you all to really dedicate yourself to some time outside of this session so that you can dig in. Um, you'll see through the slides that there are tons of embedded links and lots of resources for you all to go off and, and do some work on your own about digging in some of the concepts that we're gonna be outlining today. In addition to some of that challenge, I also wanted to, to acknowledge um, where I'm coming from, which is that I am a white, cisgendered, straight person, and I hold a, a position of, of power and privilege in my organization at the dorm. And, you know, my ask the components of the presentation that I'm going to be speaking about today really come from my lived experience in those identities. And I want to really you know, talk to my peers in this part of the presentation. I wanna to talk to people who hold privileges um, and, and really ask you to do some good thinking, both while I'm talking and also after the presentation about what we as mental health professionals, what we have in the field, what we as white folks can do to start addressing or continue the process of addressing these, um, these kind of really important racial and, 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 and bias and discrimination things that happen in our, um, in our field. So we're gonna be looking at why anti-racism work belongs in our industry. We're gonna talk about some concepts in education and then of course, how to bring that into our therapeutic practices. So let's get into it. So how long has it taken for us to get here? The, the answer is too long, centuries, generations. I wanted to highlight that the American Psychiatric Association recently issued a formal apology to, to black indigenous and people of color for 200 years of institutionalized racial practices. Um, they, they issued that on Martin Luther King Day that, this year. Um, the, the link there to the statement, the full statement is on the screen and you'll have the, the, the slides when you um, following the presentation, but I encourage you to read it. It's powerful. It's just one step. Um, but it really did acknowledge that, you know, early psychiatric pra practices laid a lot of the groundwork for inequities in clinical treatment um, and limited quality access to psychiatric care and, and really disturbingly um, subjected people of African descent, indigenous people to abusive treatment, experimentation, victimization, all in the name of science or, or medicine. Uh, and that this has laid the foundation for a lot of modern day uh, imp uh, baked in racist um, components to what we do in the mental health field. Some of the, the more recent um, fallout from that impact of the generations of racial bias in mental health is that um, there's lots of examples of how um, prevailing black stereotypes in psychiatry. In particular, this is also from a his history document that, uh, that accompanies the APA statement, um, but that, that, that black folks were hostile, hostile or unmotivated for treatment or even had a primitive character structure, which is even a really uncomfortable thing for me to say, but it's, really, it's important for us to acknowledge that this is true. This is what's been happening in our field. And, Obviously psychiatry was the beginning to a lot of our, our own disciplines, whether we be in social work or counseling or psychi psychology. And that psychiatric misdiagnosis among black indigenous and people of color um, throughout decades has been, has been common and continues. And we'll get into some of the, the patterns in that and, and some of the research around that in a minute, but that we, we know that there um, were misattributed um, diagnoses and, and people of color were treated differently than white patients with the same 
reported presenting problems. So these, these early foundations in our practice or in our field um, have led to lots of consequences and in particular, the consequences of inaction and the legacy that we have in this field. And I'm gonna go through each one and I want, want it, well, some of them, some of the more common uh, and, and important concepts for y'all to think about. And you might've heard some of these things along the way in pro different professional development events and reading that you've done and other kinds of um, environments that you've been in. And so I wanna just name them and I'm gonna give us a little bit of information, but then also give you some homework assignments, like I said. So. You might have thought about the concept of implicit bias. It is something that is learned. We all learn uh, implicit biases. Really implicit bias are unconscious attitudes towards people that, that really uh, reliably predict our behavior more than what we would state our conscious values of. So we often say, you know, there's people who say, I don't treat patients differently based on race or other identity, identity factors. And the fact of the matter is that we often have an implicit bias that has been learned and become unconscious and therefore does result in different behaviors to different folks. And so it's our, our responsibility to really focus on, you know, understanding what are the things that we've been taught by society. Um, we know that the lack of diversity in mental health professional is, in the mental health profession, is, is, is a significant problem in, in all the health disciplines, not only psychiatry or psychology, um, in social work, in counseling, in the field in general, the uh, majority of practitioners are white and that does not uh, match the breakdown of the overall population in the United States. We know that because of this implicit bias, but also because of uh, the fact that, that providers are not often having shared experiences of of racism um, and living in, in uh, the lived experience of being a person of color, a black person in particular in this community, in, in this country, that that results in microaggressions and, and barriers to accessing uh, providers with shared identities. So one of the things that we've done at the dorm and I've done in other professional spaces too is, is participate in the Harvard's Project Implicit, which is an online um, test that you can participate in and get feedback about what are some of your biases? What are some of the things that you prefer? How do you respond to different stimuli? So if you haven't done that before, I really encourage you to do it. It's a, it's a fascinating experience. Another consequence of inaction, like I mentioned before, is barriers to care. And the barriers to care come from, from all of these years of, of really problematic behaviors in the mental health field. So compared to white people, white patients, black, indigenous, and people of color are more likely to be perceived as dangerous and thus restrained, coerced, or medicated in psychiatric ERs at more frequently than white patients. Um, they're more frequently treated with drugs over psychotherapy, uh, more likely to be di diagnosed um, or misdiagnosed with serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia. Um, white patients that present in the same way as a black patient may be more likely to be diagnosed with a softer uh, psychotic disorder um, or quote unquote softer. It also importantly to identify is that, that um, black indigenous and, and other people of color are underdiagnosed with post-traumatic stress disorder and other mood disorders, which can get in the way of them accessing appropriate care for uh, really significant mood disorders that they might be struggling from. Often uh, con contributed to um, the, the racial trauma that maybe they are likely experiencing frequently. In addition to those barriers, we know that um, compared to white patients, Black, Indigenous, and people of color are less likely to have access to mental health services. That might be because of histories of redlining in communities um, of color, not having the resource, same resources as white communities. Um, they're less likely to receive needed care and more likely to receive poor quality of care um, and less likely to seek out services. And, you know, honestly, I, I understand why. If you know that there's been generations of mistreatment in a field, then I 
might be hesitant to seek out care too. Or I might wonder, what am I going to go? What am I going to experience when I go and meet with somebody who, um, who might not understand my lived experience? Another consequence of, of inaction and, and, um, and the legacy of this, these institutional racist practices is white supremacy. And I remember about seven or eight years ago, I started hearing the term white supremacy separate from what I grew up thinking white supremacy was. And really, harp, I had a really strong reaction. Like, I don't think I would describe myself as a white supremacist. That's other people. But it's really important for those of us who hold white identities to understand that this system is designed, that white supremacy means that the system is designed to prioritize my needs, the needs of white patients and the needs of white providers. And that comes at the cost of folks who are not white. By the way, it also comes at a cost to us too, because it causes us to erase aspects of our identity that then becomes um, generalized into this experience of whiteness that might make us lose components of our personal culture as well. Part of that legacy is white silence and white and and white apathy. It's um, about maintaining the status quo, and you know it's a really strong societal value that that white folks in the United States have. I was taught it um, to not talk about race. It's uh, not polite. Don't need to talk about it. I was raised in a family where we were taught we are nice white folks that don't need to talk about, you know, it's, we don't see color. And my parents are very much the type of parents that would, would say, would describe themselves the value of being very uh, service minded and, and, and really uh, liberal kind of well-meaning white folks. And, but that, what that does is it, it whitewashes the experience. It makes it so that we're not taking responsibility for how that silence maintains the status quo. And it's uncomfortable. We have to unlearn that and we have to take the risk of actually talking about it and teaching ourselves that, it's, uh, that, it, that the silence is part of the problem. And one of the books that I've read that, that was really meaningful to me was uh, Me and White Supremacy by Leila F. Saad. And in that book, and I have a link here, so if you wanna check it out, Leila says, if you, are will, if you are willing to dare to look white supremacy right in the eye and see yourself reflected back, you are going to become better equipped to dismantle it within yourself and within your communities. So it's really about us taking a hard look and understanding what is our role here. Um, I'm really proud, I, I just mentioned my parents, I'm, I'm proud of my dad, he's 76 years old and he has uh, just started participating in a discussion group with some of his peers reading a book called Waking Up White, where he has learned some of the concepts of race and white privilege and white supremacy for the first time in his life. And, and he would have described himself as somebody who was completely involved in the civil rights era and all of these kind of cool things in the 60s. And yet he has not learned this until this day. And, but now he is. So thank goodness, it's never too late. So talking about this, you know, it, it can feel so daunting. It, it can feel like, oh my God, you know, white guilt starts to come out. Like, oh, this is just so much. How can I possibly unravel 200, 400, 600 years of all of this mistreatment? Um, we really have to fight against that as white people. We have, to, we have to say, you know what? It's our time, we need to do this. And this is uh, our responsibility and we can't become apathetic. We need to do the work. So I wanted to just provide a list here, knowing that we, we have just a short time to talk about some of this as an introductory, but we'd like to be able to spend time in the future breaking down some of these uh, concepts and creating space for us to really learn together. But your homework assignments are to go off and look into some of these concepts. Um, I've included some um, resources here, white fragility and white apathy get in the way. Um, you might have heard things like white tears, you know, as soon as somebody might give us feedback about a microaggression or feedback about something we said that was problematic, that it just hurts so much and what are we going to do and it becomes 
uh, so devastating to us that it makes us not be able to continue in the work or worse, the people who are giving us feedback who are often people of color then need to care for us, which is exactly the opposite of what needs to happen. We need to take responsibility for our learning. Like I talked about before, white supremacy and white privilege, um, we really need to unlearn our implicit bias. It's not our fault that we were taught by society some of these concepts of, of stereotypes and other uh, related uh, paradigms that we've built in our brain, but it is our responsibility to unlearn them and to become familiar with the way our own brain works and to counteract them. We need to become more aware of microaggressions Microaggressions are the little things that we do just that don't seem terrible, but when but they are terrible and they add up. Um, an example of a microaggression might be that you are on a, a subway in New York City and it's a fairly empty train. Somebody, a person of color, a black man walks into the, uh, the train car and sits down next to you and you get up and move to the other side of the car. That's a microaggression. That is um, a, a problematic behavior based on what you affiliate that person, the stereotypes, other kinds of implicit biases that you have. We need to understand racial trauma that, that, that is traumatizing for people to be um, withstanding day in and day out violence, murder, mistreatment, microaggressions, um, the, the country, I think, learned a lot and had a big wake up call over the years, um, seeing over and over again, the murder of unarmed folks, children, um, even the murder of people who, who are sleeping in their beds um, and, and that it happens over and over again. And that is traumatizing. We need to understand racial identity development. Racial identity development is a really important concept that we as therapists and providers in the mental health field are not necessarily taught, uh, which we need to question why, but really understanding, you know, how did somebody develop a, a, a relationship with, with their understanding of their racial identity? There's um, some, some really uh, good concepts there about pre-encounter and encounter. Pre-encounter is when children don't don't even realize that they might be part of a group that somebody else created. You know why? Oh, you call you call this group something, um, and then pre and then and then encounter is when somebody encounters for the first time discrimination discrimination or racism based on the group that they're part of, and what that is like for somebody as they're developing their own identity as a child or a teenager. So look into ra understanding racial identity development and I, I gave a link there to just some really good resources. Another resource that's, that I hope is helpful for folks is as an organization, it's a national organization, but has local chapters called Showing Up for Racial Justice or SURGE. Um, actually, Adriana is gonna use a, a, or highlight a SURGE resource for you all um, in, in her part of the talk, but um, SURGE is a really powerful organization that helps break down some of these some of these components, it continues to teach, but it also helps to do some community organizing about how we can engage with this work in our communities, in our families, in our professional development. So my, my hope is for this component, this, this part of the presentation is to help motivate you and not to become apathetic, not to be overwhelmed, but to say, listen, this is something we can do and we're doing it. And, Kudos to, uh, to those of you who have taken some steps. Kudos to people who have started to have those uncomfortable, uncomfortable conversations, but let's keep going. We need to keep going. We need to push ourselves. This is not easy to do. So one of the things that, that can be really helpful is to develop affinity spaces, um, to have those hard conversations about the complicity with systems of, of, uh, of institutionalized racism, also to allow for some support for, for staff or clients of color. So affinity spaces to be more explicit are groups of white folks that come together and talk about the experience of white supremacy. Um, groups of, of black staff that can come together and talk about the experience of being black staff members in a, in a, in a, in a space that might be majority white. 
Um, so creating those affinity spaces is really important. I also linked a resource here called Talking About Race, which is actually from the Smithsonian uh, here in DC. It's a really awesome resource about starting the conversations. How do we understand some of these components? And it can be a resource that we can use for our staff and for ourselves as colleagues, but it can also be a resource to be used with clients. I encourage you to take a look at areas of oppression within your work practices. You know, take a, a, another view at policies and procedures, at HR practices. Take another look and see if there's anything baked in that you actually have the ability to change. Um, this might be around um, calling 911 first when there's an emergency or not, uh, knowing that 911 is not always um, the safest practice for. For, for many folks, for instance, when police are the first ones to arrive in a psychiatric crisis, that can be very dangerous for, for clients of color. I encourage you to, to learn the skills of intervention when it comes to microaggressions. So microaggressions are micro, <laughs> they're tiny. So sometimes they're hard to catch. And what I know is that usually what happens when I commit a, a microaggression or I hear a microaggression in my community is I, I, I kind of like, I, I usually don't even have words. I usually have a visceral reaction, something like, ow, or ooh. <laughs> and what I do is I just make a noise because I don't know the right thing to say. But if I can make a noise, it marks it. It says like, oh, that was a thing. Can we stop? and figure out what that thing was. Um, one of the legacies of, of white supremacy is, is perfectionism. So a lot of us are perfectionists and we say, if I don't know just the right thing to say, I don't know if I should say anything at all. Well, that's not gonna cut it. We have to do something, um, which leads me to the next point about you will make mistakes. I've made mistakes, I continue to, but apologize one good time. Uh, over apologizing, Becoming too emotional, that becomes a burden. Acknowledge what you did, apologize one good time and leave it at that, and then go off and do the work about how to do it differently next time. I encourage everyone to amplify the voices of black and brown colleagues and professionals. Uh, you know, the, these voices are often marginalized, so we need to use our privilege to say, hey, these folks are having a good conversation, you need to, you need to listen up. And sometimes in staff experiences or with clients, there can be experiential activities. I listed a couple names here. You can Google what they are after this, but um, five moments, I am, but I'm not uneven resource distribution. Five no moments, for example, are sharing five moments in your life that are defining. And you might hear some things about people's identity come out in those conversations. And just a minute here um, to talk about some of the ways that we're integrating this into the dorm programming. So what we think about, and some of you who know about the dorm, we do a lot of skill building. We have a focus on functioning and developing skills. So if we're working with people about independent living skills, then we absolutely need to recognize that the same type of learning skills of independent living or how to be a young adult are also, people are also capable of learning the skills of how to be an anti-racist. So anti-racist skills can be taught. Um, there's a wonderful book by Ibram X. Kendi, um, I hope you have ha heard about or read, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist, that really helps flesh out a lot of the concepts that I've talked about today and why. what are some of the steps that you can take uh, to unlearn some of these behaviors. Like I talked about recognizing and intervening in microaggressions, teaching that to clients while we're also learning it is really, really important. We wanna learn, have our clients learn the skills of advocacy and bystander intervention. And we wanna explore their identity development and create space for that. At the dorm, we have a group that we call Justice, Service and Advocacy where our clients are looking both inside and outside of the dorm, outside in our communities. How can we as an organization engage in justice? Um, how can we do that within ourselves? So they often give us feedback about things that we could do differently at the dorm. We have a book club where we read books specifically around this area and other things like short stories about the immigrant experience or other kinds of experience. And in the pro we're in the process of, of creating some spaces um, for um, black indigenous and, and people of color, clients of color um, within our organization as well. 
On that note, I'm gonna hand things over to Adriana to talk a little bit more about how to bring this into our therapeutic practices and our mental health spaces. Wonderful, thank you, Sarah. I am actually really excited to be here with you all. And as Sarah said, kudos to all of you for showing up to the space. I am pretty sure that just by the topic of the round table that there is it's an uncomfortable feeling that may come up for a lot of you and yet you showed up. So kudos to that. I wanted to share with you just my background very quickly. I actually thought for the longest time in terms of just knowing my father and my mother that I was black and um, Caucasian. However, with the advent of DNA testing, I actually took a DNA test and found out that actually, yes, I was black and white but I'm also 20% Native American, which was absolutely fascinating uh, to me. So I'm still, it's still very early news to me in terms of trying to trace that genealogy and tribe. Um, I also wanna give you the disclaimer that what I'm going to be talking about in terms of my lived experiences and to elucidate some of the points that I will be making are my experiences. It does not represent that of all black, indigenous people of color experience. Um, so I want you to keep that in mind. All right, so what you'll notice, my actual first slide talks about looking at your personnel. I think it's so important, and Sarah touched on this very quickly yeah, in her part of the discussion. Really looking at your website, does your organization reflect the diverse population in your area? That is such an important piece. I remember when I first looked at PCH website in 2014, when I was considering changing from the nonprofit organization that I was for 15 years and loved it because it felt like home. It was multiracial, mostly black and brown clinicians. And that felt safe. However, my daughter at the time was 12 years old and decided um, to disclose to me that she was not very happy about my being gone from the moment we woke up until the moment it was time for her to go to bed. So that then shifted me in looking for a place to work that was closer to home. And PCH happens to be about 7.9 miles away from uh, where I live. And however, looking at the website and I start scrolling down and there was just the sea of white people, white faces after the other, there was not one person of color up until the last picture. And it was like, oh, I took note. Um, scrolling through that picture, um, that page was really very intimidating, feelings of not good enough, incompetence, which is all a part of the white supremacy um, system that we're brought up in certainly was taking over my nervous system. However, I saw this one black face on the picture and what a small world, because it happened to be my cousin. So I was like, oh, if, if my cousin actually can work with these white people, I, I guess it's worth checking out. So I did um, interview and the other part I wanna talk about is when you are interviewing people of color, be mindful of who's in the room. When I came to my interview, and actually Jeff is on, um, the owner of PCH is also on this um, talk, so he'll remember this. When I came to the interview, there were three white men in the, in the room and two white females in the, inter in the interview with me. That was the most scariest experience for me. And so I would say if you are looking, again, in terms of recruiting and trying to, um, diversify your organization, be mindful one of when, you're, when your um, website, what your website is showing, but also two, when somebody of color is coming into the interview, that perhaps being faced with five white people can be very terrifying and perhaps maybe downsizing the number of people that interviews that candidate. Now, I also want to talk about what it's like to be, in my experience, the only person of color in a space. In 20, 
2018, I believe, I was invited to go to North Carolina to ha uh, do a conference and to speak about uh, obsessive compulsive disorder and postpartum, uh, postpartum psychosis versus postpartum OCD. The flight from California to my connecting flight was diverse, people from LA felt okay. When I had to do my connecting flight from that airport to South Carolina, I was the only person of color on that flight. And I don't know if you've ever been on a flight where going to a smaller town, there's no seat assignment. You get to sit where you wanna sit and your head can possibly touch the top of the, where you put your, um, your, lug your luggage. So you get to sit where you wanna sit and talk about microaggression. I certainly sat where I felt comfortable. I sat at a window seat. And so as people were coming on, there were no persons of color and everyone sitting and coupling with other people, except for me. I was left on a plane where it was very visible that all seats assignments and where you could sit had two people at minimum sharing those seats, except for my seat. And so that was a really eye-opening um, experience for me. Now, turning to your policies and procedures, Sarah touched upon this as well. So embedded in this slide is, as she said, from Surge showing up for racial justice. There is this uh, slide that talks about really looking at your policies and procedures and trying to ensure that white supremacy culture is taken out of that. It, it is hard, we breathe it, so it's really hard to not have it in your policies and proce procedures. I just wanna review quickly just four points. There's so many more in this document that you can take a look at and review, but issues around say uh, perfectionism is issues around, uh, is a white supremacy char characteristic that you always want to be, you know, aware of. So the focus of, of perfectionism, of course, is that something you're, you're doing it wrong or that there are issues around inadequacy. The antidote to that, that the document talks about is really trying to develop a culture of learning and appreciation. Another characteristic of white supremacy is either or thinking. And that's pretty self-explanatory, right? It's right or wrong, it's black or white. Um, and the antidote is really to encourage both and thinking that there could be both, there could be multiple truths to something. The third characteristic is individualism. And people believe that they must solve problems alone and you have to do things yourself if you want it done right. So if you're noticing that in your policies and procedures or in the context of your organization, really pay attention to that and you wanna uh, shift away from evaluating people on those characteristics and more on their ability to delegate, for instance. And then a really important white um, supremacy characteristic that I think is so embedded is the right to comfort. And that is where belief, the people who hold power, there is a belief that those who hold power have the right for emotional and psychological comfort. And the antidote really is welcoming discomfort and, and knowing that discomfort actually can lead to growth and learning, okay? So how do we, in terms of, how do we make anti-racism a value? I think really understand the difference between prior, priority and a value is so important. So priority, I think that a lot of people since the George Floyd murder or, or what I would say a public lynching of George Floyd, priorities, a lot of organizations have made anti-racism a priority, right? Something of importance that changes due to outside influences and demands. I would ask you to consider making anti-racism a value. And a value is a core principle that an outside influence or demand is unable to change. For those of you who are trained in, trained, um, trained in acceptance and commitment therapy, value is further defined as a freely chosen life direction. 
one that is not socially or culturally transmitted. And that is a interesting point because most of what we know, if our system is one that is based on white supremacy, a lot of the values that we ourselves have are socially and culturally transmitted and are embedded in white supremacy. So unlike a goal, a value is something that you just, you don't ac accomplish a value. It is a compass. It tells you the direction to go, okay? And then the other thing is, once you have your value, act according to your value. Now, when I first came to um, PCH, of course, I got past the fright of there being only one black person at PCH, got in here, met Jeff. And what I will tell you is PCH has always had a value of equality and justice. And Jeff has actually gotten, on, gotten into many fights in social media <laughs> um, with so many people across the United States just because he won't keep his mouth shut and he will speak out about inequality and injustice. He's gotten into fights with people at PCH in terms of marketing folks, because the, the, the other truth is those marketing people recognize that there is a population that you will not, that you will turn away if you, this becomes your value. And so there is that cost um, to it. But, I, and I also recall probably about, I think two years ago, we had this one gentleman, I won't, he's, I will say up north, for those of you who know California. So somewhere between Los Angeles and San Francisco, this gentleman and his dad decided they were gonna, they selected PCH to come to treatment. However, the first encounter he had of PCH was at that time we had um, a transgendered client and he was dressed in his dress and high heels. And so when clients are first come to PCH, they're greeted by someone who is the coordinator for the orientation day. And that person went to go greet the father and son. The son was the prospective client. The son basically immediately said to this staff member who appears white, but actually she was Latinx and says to her, oh, I, I can't be in a place with people like these. And so the employee comes to me and says, Adriana, can you please come and help me because I'm about to choke this person out um, and I don't know what to do. They're, not, they're, they're saying they're not gonna stay here because we have transgendered people. At that point, I thought, hmm, I'm not sure how much help I'm going to be because if he's having feelings about transgendered people, I'm wondering what he's going to think when he sees me. So of course I walk in thinking, okay, I, I'm the clinical director, I need to at least go try. So I walk in to introduce myself as the clinical director. Immediately, he, his whole posture changed. He was completely surprised and got up and was like, oh yeah, no, 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 this is not the place. I, I can't be, I cannot be in a place like this. So of course, trying to ask, I said, is there any possibility that this way of viewing the world have led to the limitation and the limiting of your social circle that have you in the place of depression and immobiliz immobilization at the moment? And is there any room for learning and growth from this, from this experience and being uncomfortable and being in a place like this? Of course, there wasn't. Both him and his father agreed that there was not, this was not an option for them. So of course, I'm thinking, I called Jeff, I said, Jeff, I'm sorry, dude, I, I couldn't land that one for you. I cannot change who I am. And I'm not surprised, of course, Jeff's, Jeff's um, response was, we don't want that kind of money anyway. And so I think it's so important when you make race, you know, anti-racism a value, it will cost you. And however, I think the benefit 
fit is really, as um, Sarah was talking about, and I'll talk about this at, at the end of um, my last slide, is really, there really is a freedom that comes with that when you can freely choose a value and stick and act according to it. Okay. I wanna highlight a couple things in terms of at PCH, uh, in terms of our programming and how we actually, actually before I do that, yes, I'll do, go, talk about just awareness promotes your valued action. So as Sarah talked about, racism is part of our socialization. The majority of us as a result are not aware of it. It's kind of like, how many of you have seen the movie, The Matrix? I love that movie by the way, right? So it's almost you're plugged in to a system and you don't know that you're in the system. It's like breathing. You don't have to pay attention to breathing, you just do. And so if we value being an anti-racist, it's going to take work. If we want to be an anti-racist, if we want to act according to our value, we are going to have to work at it. Okay, in order to, to be woke, in order to wake up, in order to be aware. So in, you, we must become aware of all the ways that we're conditioned to perpetrate racism and uphold the system. And part of that, that Sarah gave some really important links in terms of your implicit bias. I encourage you to do that. I, I certainly have done mine, um, but also understanding your privilege. For me, I understand from even for me, I am college educated, I'm able-bodied, I am a cisgendered person, I'm heterosexual, I'm Christian. And the last one might surprise you. I will, in terms of my putting this as a privilege, but it's an offshoot and an inherited issue uh, from racism. I'm light-skinned. And so there is an issue around colorism and shadism that goes beyond this talk, that very much is one of the offshoots and that we've inherited as a result of slavery and racism in this country. So in terms of making the unconscious conscious, that's what I'm talking about in terms of really understand your privilege, your implicit bias and being intentional Right. If you are to be intentional about your actions, you're going to need to be aware of what is and is not racist actions. Now, awareness in and of itself is not enough. You can be aware, but it takes action. Okay. So it takes awareness and intentional action okay, is the key for us to be able to dismantle the system of oppression. In terms of at PCH, our, the ways that we actually try to ensure that our, the value of an anti-racist, the anti-racist value is a part of our system. I, the philosophy of PCH in and of itself, in terms of just destigmatizing clients, we really don't do a lot of labels. We certainly have to diagnose clients for insurance purposes and reimbursement for clients, but we really truly believe that labels are for cans, not for people. And so we really talk about that with our clients that yes, there's a diagnosis in your chart, but here let's talk about your lived experience. Let's talk about what's going on and let's honor that. And so just the philosophy of PCH in and of itself is non-stigmatizing. And as Sarah talked about, it's creating these space, these space for healing. One such space after uh, the George Floyd murder is our social action committee. That is a subgroup of people who come together to ensure that, that we're planning for the social justice meeting. We have different pillars of that uh, committee, including it, it's about education, it's about service. And actually there's an artivism show that we're having today that if you're interested, let us know, we'll send you the link, all are welcome. And in our social justice meeting, the purpose of what I'll read to you, which one of my supervisees um, helped to develop the purpose of the social justice meeting in collaboration with the group. And it reads, 
So this group is meant to provide a brave space for honest and open dialogue in order to learn our nation's history and unlearn the conditioned bias, biases that uphold white supremacy and systems of oppression. We recognize that each person who attends this meeting is bringing with them their own multiple identities and lived experiences. We expect there will be discomfort, but we will lean into that discomfort by honoring and working the working agreements we have created in collaboration. These agreements can be updated as necessary to meet the needs of the groups. I won't go over all the working agreements, but some of them include impact and intent. We are assuming positive intent, but we are going to acknowledge impact, right? So if you stepped on somebody's toe, you don't intend to step on body, somebody's toe, but the impact is that you did step on their toe and you hurt them. So acknowledging impact and what we call call-ins and call-ins as opposed to call out is calling you into my experience you, in terms of even just yesterday, one of the individuals in the social justice meeting made a comment about one of the, one of the black therapists who, who was sharing her experience about that she's always eloquent in her speech. And for me, I had the, and again, this is way beyond this round table in terms of black exceptionalism. And so I called her in to that experience so that we can talk about that and the impact that that word, using that word for this clinician um, had, had on me. And then the other thing is really having a culture, a culture, justice, and identity group. And this is for clients where we have embedded within our program a group for clients that deal with these issues. And then my last slide, which is really about never give up. Well, this is this that slide, Amerita, can you go back one? Yeah, this slide is really for you in terms of some of the spaces. If you're gonna have a multiracial setting um, to discuss these issues, these are some of the tips for white people engaging in multiracial space. And then my last slide is about never give up. And Sarah discussed this as well, that dismantling systems of oppression will take time, energy, and it will be painful. And I would like you to, Consider make like we ask our clients to do, make space for whatever comes up, whatever discomfort comes up. And we usually tell our clients, right, that pain plus resistance equals suffering. And I love the quote by Viktor Frankl, who says, between stimulus and response, there is a space. So the stimulus, which is pain, the space, if you do resist, if you if you resist whatever comes up will likely lead to suffering. But, but he says, in that space is our power to choose our response. In our, in our response lies our growth and our freedom. And remember that again, if in terms of your value, that a value is a freely chosen life directive. And if you are going to choose anti-racism, that truly is something that is free because you are not being conditioned. You are condi actually, you are conditioned to be within that system. So to, to choose anti-racism is to go against that system. And so it will take time, it will take energy, it will be painful. But I ask you to not give up and I ask you to join and be allies for people of color. And the fact is that I can't give up. I can't remove my skin, I can't remove my hair texture and my genetics. And so I ask you to not give up and to fight with us, that action is the key. I, I also wanna encourage you, like my son, when he was five and just as a little black boy in school, I used to get, I mean, he's just so passionate. He is full of, full of energy and just love. He would have these experiences of joy that we would call joygasms. And, and he was just so talkative. And in kindergarten, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna call his teacher because her and I have worked out our differences, Miss Johnson. Miss Johnson, one day, Alex was doing whatever Alex was doing, being a five-year-old boy, delivers Alex from kindergarten to after school to Miss Sewell. And let Miss Sewell know, 
Alex had a really hard day. I asked him what needed to happen for him to feel better. And he still didn't, you know, he still didn't, um, it still didn't work. So Alex raises his hand and says, excuse me, Ms. Johnson, you asked me what I could do to feel better, not if I would do better. And so I'm asking you to do better, that a space like this may make you feel like you're doing something and it may make you feel better about anti-racism, but it goes beyond here. So I'm asking you, please do better. Thank you. Thank you, Adriana. I, I, you know, Adriana, and I, Adriana and I had a couple of meetings along with our colleagues to plan this, and we kind of knew, like, how do we cram this all <laughs> into our hour? And so we we knew that this might go a little bit longer than what our normal um, sessions are. So I just wanted to say thank you, though, because we could go on and on. I have a feeling like I want to stay here with you all. Um, I want to keep talking about this, but I really am just so grateful for you. Um, and for all of you for being here with us. So it's it's 356 according to my clock. And um, I there is one question that came through. I, I, I wanted to just kind of read it and also encourage you if you have questions or reactions, um, or things that you want us at the dorm or PCH to continue to think about or come back at a round table in the future with, please don't hesitate to jot it in because we'll, we'll really uh, record all of these questions and, and comments coming through. Um, but just because there's the one question here, um, and thanks Laura Place <laughs> for your comment. I, Laura and I used to work together, so it's nice to see your name, Laura. Um, the qu question, um, that came through Elizabeth put in the chat that said, if a program wants to invest in anti-racism and diversity training for staff members, where do they, where, how should they begin? Um, and then there's another question there that says, how do I create a space, a better environment for any um, team members who are black, indigenous or people of color? Those are deep questions. Adriana, is there anything that you feel like you could just give a little 30 second or 60 second, just where to start um, for some, staff training in addition to what you've already talked about in the presentation? You know, there is a really, how many, I don't know if you've heard of, um, so you wanna talk about race. I, you, you've given a, a few items, Sarah, but a really great book. And I think really looking at supporting black businesses to begin with, you talked about clinicians as well, Sarah, but Ujama, Balu wrote this amazing book, So You Want to Talk About Race. And I think that is a great resource. And there is a specific chapter specifically too for, for white people. So I would encourage you to check that out. And I, I would just add on that, you know, there's a lot of work that needs to be done um, without yet starting with your team, because that can then sometimes, especially as you're a, a leader, I'm a, a leader at, at the dorm DC, and I know I need to, to start with myself so that when I approach, I'm not asking my team members to educate me, although of course we can collaborate with each other, but I do, it doesn't mean to delay the work. It just means to get to work now, do some work on your own with your peers, and then come together and create some intentional spaces to start having some of these dialogues. And I, I agree that, so you wanna talk about race is a great, a great book. And then just a lot of shout outs, a lot of shout outs. Thank you, Adriana, for a really powerful um, talk. And I really appreciate seeing some and it feels like a, a nice opportunity for all of us to come together and start this, you've got a homework assignment. Tracy will tell you as she uh, closes us out or if John, I don't know who's closing us out, but um, Tracy will be. So that you're gonna get the slides. Um, so the, all of those links are in there. So you're gonna have your homework assignment. So um, we can't wait to continue the conversation having done some of the work in between here and there. So Tracy, I'll pass it over to you, close us up. Absolutely. So next week, please join us March 4th with Mountainside. And we will be talking about um, the continuum of care.
We really thank you for your support of the dorm roundtables. And again, to my friend, Adriana, that was just so powerful. And um, we are just so grateful to have you join us today. And my friend, Jeff Ball, thank you. Great to see you, my friend. Thanks yeah, everyone. Just a quick, Tracy, if I can just jump in, just a quick plug. Um, PCH is doing um, Artivism tonight. I think it's at 5.30, yeah? Yes, 5.30. Can you, can you throw time, that? But... Jeff, can you throw that into the link real quick, into the chat so people can grab it? Um, let, me, let me see. All right. If not, what we'll do is we'll follow up with an email. Everybody, you'll get the slide presentation. You'll get the link for the Artivism event tonight mm -hmm. with PCH. Please check it out. Also yeah, include- come, come support. Come support people. My daughter is going to be doing a, a, a piece. So come support us. Love it. I will get the follow-up email out tonight and I'll make sure that link is included. I'll get it out in the next hour. If you guys can send me that link. Or a PDF of the website. I don't have the Zoom available, but we can get that to you. Okay, so, just send it so, to me. The show, you yeah. know, 5.30 is like a, an art reception um, to introduce kind of our arts program and the artivism. The, um, the website's gonna be up for a long time. So, you know, whenever people wanna look at it and they're really amazing works in the thing. The, the one other thing I wanted to add really quickly, and Adriana talked about kind of the cost of being anti-racist and you might lose clients. I, my feeling is there's a greater cost of not being that way in terms of your soul, in terms of, and, and I also think you attract more like-minded people. So I think it evens out, but that was my only thought. Indeed, thank you, Jeff. Adriana, thank you, Sarah, thank you. And thank you all for leaning into this. This is gonna be the first of many conversations that, that certainly we partnered in particular with PCH because of the value that we, we similarly put on this. So um, we're grateful to you all and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Bye guys. <laughs>